Um, How you doing? Good. It's morning. I have my coffee here. Um, there's a bit of construction next door, but I'm just hoping that that'll be fine and we'll just roll with it because that's life. Yep. Um, yeah, how are you doing? What if you, you are off the field at the moment? With yeah, your... I tore my Achilles a couple of weeks ago um, during my game in Chicago. Uh, so I've just been laid up at home, resting, recovering, and um, all that jazz. So I'm out for the rest of the year, which is a bummer, but yeah, it's that, all right. That's a massive bummer. Like, okay, so just to be clear for you and everybody listening, like I don't know anything about American football. I didn't grow up in America. I grew up in Australia and Thailand. I mean, we have rugby union and we've got mm. AFL, but yeah. But yeah, so I was doing a bit of research on you <laughs> before, oh, this <laughs> before this before oh, this podcast man. because uh, I feel this pressure of being professional on my non-professional podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Romeo Oquara, is that how I pronounce your last name? Yeah, Oquara. Oquara. Um, yeah. from the Detroit Lions. Um, it, I found out you are an outside linebacker. Is that correct? <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> so that, that's playing defense, right? Mm-hmm. Defense right. on the edge. Defense on the edge. Okay. Um, there's a lot to do with creativity there, but basically for everyone listening, like the reason why, like, I think you're the first professional uh, sports person that I have on this podcast. And the reason why I was drawn to Romeo and his space and his point of view was was through your photography. And that's probably a language that I can understand and relate to uh, being a creative person. And yeah, we, we really have mainly creative people on this podcast. And, and I love to share the different perspectives of how people see the world and I think that kind of diversity is what makes the world such a great beautiful place um, so yeah your photography really spoke to me um, for those listening it's like black and white documentary photography um, but what I like I got a real sense of of a real human side to you as probably someone who's quite good with people, um, someone who can be someone in the corner kind of hiding away, like trying to wait, waiting for that perfect moment to capture a person. You do usually capture people as your subject, which I, I really love your portraits of your family and your team members and also the, the firefighters that you shot. Um, but I think I want to circle Let's let's talk about the now right now and then let's talk about your past and how you kind of got to this point of where you are in your life right now. Um, yeah. So, you know, you're out. Let's talk about last year, COVID, because I think a lot of how we see ourselves in the world, our identity has a lot of change, you know, to do with the coronavirus. Um, tell me about what last year was like in your life. Were you in a bubble? Yeah, so last year was kind of interesting um, because of COVID, obviously, and going through all the, uh, the different changes in, in our lives uh, because of that. Um, we didn't really know if the season was going to happen at various points of the off season. And But as athletes, you got to stay ready. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just, you know, you can't just sit at home and, not work out, you know, most things were closed. Eat Cheetos. But I, yeah, eat Cheetos. <laughs> uh, but at certain points, like, I was, like, in my backyard with some friends, like, figuring stuff out. I think, like, one of my friends bought a keg once, and, like, <laughs> we, were doing, we were doing, like, little little lifts in the backyard, like, looking like idiots. But it was just kind of – it was uh, an interesting off season because of that. And um, once the hey. season got going, it was 
reflection <laughs> reflection of your values you're like in the backyard when there's like complete uncertainty about the future and you're lifting kegs instead of drinking them <laughs> <laughs> yeah whatever the job calls for i guess um but yeah it was kind of interesting that we had to play the season uh without fans which was unheard of uh, that's kind of um you know is that uh, the, weird one of the main reasons yeah it was really weird because that was one of the main reasons uh you know uh, we play this game. It's just like kind of feeding off the energy of the fans in the stadium, and you know, just uh, playing for in front of the local local team and just kind of uh, sh- having that uh, same engagement with the fans that we do. Um, mm-hmm. So it was it was a little weird without those like, I guess like those cues we'd usually get. Uh, yeah, it's like stadium. if you score a touchdown or something, you're used to like the crowd roaring and everyone and like you. It would be like crickets, like exactly. You hear the crowd <laughs> before the touchdown is even scored. So like. Uh, last year, there'd be a touchdown and it'd be, it'd be quite, you'd be expecting the sound, but it'd be completely quiet. So you're like, all right, look, look. Yeah. you can't really see sometimes when you're uh, on the sideline. So you didn't really know what happened. That would be quite like a humbling experience as well. Just like, just to have, you know, like there's so many studies with like babies and facial reactions and and how much we feed as uh, they tell us, like how much as humans we feed off like, other human reaction um so it would be yeah. really weird um to play like that but yeah how, for sure how did you deal with that uncertainty did you just have to like plot a point to aim for even though you didn't know what was going to happen yeah it was kind of just like this like mindset of like stay ready um you know as athletes we're kind of conditioned that way and there's nothing else like it wouldn't really sit right with me if I was just kind of at home, um, you know, just letting the days go by. Um, you know, we were just getting ready for the season uh, like we would know where you would. And it kind of helps also fill out our time. Uh, I mean, us getting ready is going to the gym for like two, three hours a day working out, which <laughs> uh, a lot of people see is just like, uh, you know, just like a hobby or whatever, just for exercise, but that's our jobs. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of like a fun, like way to like <laughs> uh, go through the off season anyway. Um, that- that but, is, yeah, I think, uh, and also being with our team. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I was going to say just also being uh, with our team when we did get back together, um, even though there were no crowds, uh, we got to, you know, kind of, you know, share that same bond. So m- most people were at home, uh, either I- isolated by themselves or with like uh, family if they were lucky um, and friends. Uh, but we had like a whole locker room full of people that, you know, we see as like brothers. Yeah. That's a really great. Um, subject to move on to because I I think a lot of people struggled with the isolation that the lockdown had and the mental health effects that that had but what's so beautiful was that being in a a professional sport and being in that sports bubble you had your teammates which like okay I've been like leading up to this podcast I've been watching a little bit about American football and like I was watching um, a Netflix a series it's about a, a community college team and um like okay. yeah and like just what i it's a documentary so like it, it's pretty real it's not hollywood you know kind of like romanticized but what i got from it was like yeah the team the sport is really a team sport and it's about family like your team becomes your family that's what i got from the 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 documentary and then what like what was kind of nice that I was able to like draw parallels between your photography and and then the sport that I was just getting to know was the fact that yeah they're all the values the underlying values that are really the foundation of both sport and your photography is is about family and human connection and that yeah. kind of kingship that you have between, like you know dude american football looks rough like you have to wear like to the point where you have to wear helmets and shoulder pads armor armor <laughs> like you know you know I, the rugby that i um know and grew up with like okay yeah it looks really rough but they don't have to wear armor like like the americans take it to like the next level and therefore like i'm sure like the battlefield, um, the hardships that you go through, the injuries, 
um, the the wins and the losses is is held by that family. Um, that yeah, yeah. Can you yeah, speak absolutely. To that's that kind of what makes it worth it at the end of the day is being able to go through all these things with your fellow teammates, um, mm -hmm. your brothers, and you know, I'm also playing with my literal brother. Uh, he plays yes. on the team with me, uh, which cool. is amazing. And we get to share that bond in that, um, this, like, I guess, this journey together. Yeah, that's sick. How long have you been playing on the same team with your brother for? Uh, he was drafted by the Lions last year, uh, so just two years. Nice. And what yeah. position is he playing in? Do you have different? We're the same position. Same position. <laughs> same room. Same, yeah, same everything. So we, we see a lot of each other. I love that. That's That yeah. would be... My sister and I don't live in the same country, but there's something to do with a, a bond that you have with a sibling that even if you're in a bad time, like we had a few years where we, I love to make everything about myself. So I'm just going to like talk about myself. For oh, a no, bit. No. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Like even if you're having bad times, it's not like a friend where you might fall out or whatever with a, with a, sibling there's a, there's an understanding you know you know each other so well that despite good or bad times you're always going to be together you know yeah yeah exactly yeah. and that's kind that's of the special thing about it you know that's it family well that goes to my other part of my research <laughs> okay <laughs> Is, okay. <laughs> okay you have to correct me if i'm wrong um, but I found out that, okay, so you're, you're a first generation Nigerian in America. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yep. And, and there are like seven other Nigerians on your team. Yeah, we have uh, seven Nigerians. And I think we, there's also like 109 Nigerians in the national football league, which is also kind of crazy. Yeah. Like I, because I just don't know much about the sport that kind of blew my mind. Like. Is there a special connection between the Nigerian culture and American football? Um, I, I guess there's a, a kind of like a, sh not necessarily a shared culture, but um, just from previous NFL players, uh, I grew up watching uh, Nigerian players in the league, like O.C. Minyora, um, who played for the Giants. He played D-line, the same position I played. And someone who I uh, kind of see as a mentor um, uh, in my career. <laughs> And, um, you know, watching guys like him growing up, especially after moving to the States at uh, such a young age, um, uh, watching uh, football, um, it was kind of impressionable. So I can imagine other Nigerians were <laughs> kind of doing the same thing uh, yeah. where they were, <laughs> they were probably watching other guys, uh, you know, that kind of shared the same kind of background as them. That's so sick. So you, so basically uh, an idol of yours growing up is, ha did become a mentor as well. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of amazing. Um, yeah. Um, all the, uh, a lot of the veterans uh, in this league uh, do a really great job of uh, just kind of reaching out to the young guys like me and helping us out, uh, which has been really amazing and just really fortunate to be able to have that connection. Yeah, that's really, like, I think having a mentor, having someone show you the ropes, um, the obvious ones and the not so obvious ones, um, it's really important in excelling in what you do and like, and also showing that respect and appreciation for somebody who walked in, walked the path before you um, is something that's very humbling and, and necessary to, to grow um, in your field and as a person as well. Um, yeah. Did, do you have um, a mentor as in photography? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I've got to meet a bunch of, uh, uh, photographers. I just was kind of along my way on this, uh, journey of photography. And, um, I don't, one of my mentors, um, actually passed, um, earlier this year, Chimodu. Um, he was a great photographer, um, mostly known for his work that he, he did in the nineties, uh, documenting, um, hip hop photography, um, and he was someone I really, uh, you know, he, he was also Nigerian, uh, which I kind of, uh, you know, was drawn to. Um, mm. And uh, he was a photographer, uh, kind of doing this thing I love. And um, yeah, that was someone I, I really thought was a mentor. 
Um, and there's been a lot of other photographers that kind of helped me along the way uh, when I met in New York. Uh, Andre Wagner is a great photographer I love. Uh, Miranda Barnes. Um, lots of photographers I can live counting his names of just like people who kind of helped me along the way. And um, photo studying photography is a thing I love doing, uh, whether it's like through different books. So there's like, um, I get knowledge from so many different resources, though. Um, yeah. it's, it's really cool that way. Yeah. Well, you have a really great eye for composition, and I also really like your tones in terms of black and white photography. I think, you know, shooting black and white is such a great foundation um, to build, like, that depth that, um, you know, playing with your contrast, black and white, you know, that the infinite shades of gray in between black and white um, is such a such a fun place to explore in photography. But if you don't yeah. mind, um, I'd like to go into like a bit of your childhood and like where can I ask you like where did you grow up? And I'm assuming yeah. in Nigeria. Yeah, so I, I was born in Nigeria and I lived there for 10 years before um, coming over to the States and moving to Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, yeah, I grew up in Lagos, which is, I think, the largest uh, city in terms of population in Africa. Yeah. Um, and it's just like a lot of energy, lots of like cultural influences, whether it's like music, uh, fashion, um, uh, you, you name it. Um, so being able to have that background is something I'm really um, proud, of, proud of and uh, yeah. glad I kind of share that uh, with a lot of my teammates now, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I think... Um, you know, Africa's such the continent of Africa is such an exciting place, especially right now. I think like Nigeria, um, Lagos is like one of the world's top ten fastest growing cities. Um, and like some people, a lot of people maybe who grew up in the West have a hard time grasping the, you know, the that kind of buzz that you get in a such a expensive, you know energetic city um yeah and that's like a crazy environment to grow up in as well um you know yeah i mean so so at 10 you moved to america yeah mm -hmm. and, and so, i moved to charlotte north carolina and that's kind of when uh i got into football it was basically that the next year and that was kind of an interesting transition going from nigeria yeah. to uh charlotte Let's, at such a young age Let's talk about that. Like, what are the main, like, you know, in your face kind of like culture shocks and adjustments that you had to face when you moved? Yeah, so I was in sixth grade. So that was kind of like an interesting uh, time yeah. in middle school because uh, I was I was the different kid. Like I was uh, <laughs> uh, I moved I was I moved in the middle of the year. So that was kind of weird uh, in its own. And um, I had an accent. Uh, or thicker accent at that time. And um, I don't know, it was kind of, I just kind of felt like I was just sticking out. Uh, I was really shy, uh, I think because of that too, because um, I don't know, I didn't really necessarily like all that kind of attention drawn me just because I was yeah. a different kid in school. So um, I just kind of kept quiet and kind of did my own thing. Yeah, yeah. I My sister and I also moved from Thailand to Australia when I was about, I would have been eight and she would have been 10. And yeah, big culture shocks, like big yeah. differences, accent for sure. And like yeah. even small things like what you're learning in school at that time may not be the same yeah. as what you were learning back at home. And like, exactly. I just felt like a dumbass. Like I just felt <laughs> like the biggest dumbass, like, you know, because the way I, I, I learned about the world was just so different. Um, and the accent is a big thing too, but you know, so many yeah, and cultures. The food and everything. Food, yeah. yes, food. Yeah, food yeah. was like, yeah. I just couldn't do sandwiches, so I, I brought fried <laughs> rice to, yeah, to school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and then, so you, then your kind of your football journey started from, from a real young age, around 10. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I tried out for the football team in seventh grade. Uh, I think my my older brother was playing in middle school, and I guess I was kind of looking looking up to him, and that's kind of when I found out first uh, about the sport of football. They tried out for the team in seventh grade, not really know much about the sport, um, and somehow made the team. Uh, I 
I just don't really remember like if I actually do what I was doing. Sometimes like when I was on the field, I was just kind of running around, <laughs> like trying to hit somebody. Which was kind of, <laughs> trying to hit and somebody. I remember, like, I remember mid midway through that season, my dad wasn't really like following me like playing football at the time. But he thought it was really dangerous, and like he like came to practice and literally pulled me off of the field and was like, "You're not playing football." And like I was really really sad. He made me play like YMCA basketball, which I was terrible <laughs> at. I think I had like a. I remember I had like a. I had to make a layup to like win a game in one day, uh, one game, and like, like I was wide open and like missed it. Like that was my only shot in the fucking game. Was, that's when I knew. Uh, you so probably. I kind of football. You probably had the hype for basketball day. Yeah, I had the hype, uh, but I don't know. I was just. I just, just really wanted to play football. Yeah, yeah, yeah at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so we're moving, we'll skip a few years and we'll move into um, when you go to college. Um, you went to Notre Dame. Yeah. That's what I have in my yeah. notes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing that, that's very different about American college or university is that that's different from like the UK or Australia where I went to school is um, you guys have to learn like a broad range of all subjects in the first um, couple of years of your yeah. degree. And then you can go and specialize. Um, what did you study? Uh, I studied accounting. Um <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd, ex- you'd expect me to study accounting most, most of the last. <laughs> I'm like, what um, a sensible human. <laughs> yeah, I was in the business school uh, at Notre Dame, um, but I wasn't necessarily like super into accounting. Uh, so I got to like have fun with like my my electives. I got to take I took a couple years of ceramics, uh, nice. took some drawing classes. Uh, took a couple years of art history and like got to do like go on some really cool programs. Like I studied uh, art history out in Greece uh, for three weeks. Beautiful. And it's like really uh, uh, amazing program uh, yeah. that the school made for athletes uh, because athletes usually don't get to know how those type of opportunities with the season and like uh, just playing the sport uh, at that level. So it was really cool. I got to get those uh, experiences as well. Yeah. Like, that's the thing is you were playing f- football the whole time throughout um, college. Like what can you kind of like ballpark? What is the percentage of time you're spending on football versus your classes? Um, basically, all my time not in class is at <laughs> football. Uh, we get like a little bit of time, like maybe like from 8 to 10 before you go to bed uh, to kind of do other stuff. Uh, wow. Mostly during the, during like a week's like a normal week schedule, and obviously weekends uh, we play the game, um, and that you know takes most of your time. Mm. Uh, so you got to really like kind of work hard to kind of balance your uh, your schedule uh, with the academics and also your um, sports. Yeah, but they say that like it's in your twenties when you form your kind of like the discipline that you'll have for the rest of your life. I hate to think that, but it's kind of I think it's true at the same yeah. time so like think so? I, I think so like mm. i've i've just like i'm 32 so I've, i'm only just like dipping my feet into the 30s but like <laughs> just seeing a lot of people like i think it it is true i think your parents are really foundational but not necessarily in some cases but like yeah the habits that you form through your 20s like that discipline of like keeping yourself in good condition, keeping dedicated to what you love and working really hard and putting in the hours for what you're doing without burning out at the same time is like that real yin-yang balance of, of what you try and figure out in your 20s, I think. I don't know much about life. Yeah, um, I think football does a really good job of teaching a lot of like life lessons like that. Um, I mean, we're kind of forced uh, to be disciplined and to have uh, these like, you know, really regimented uh, like schedules. Um, I mean, our whole like, one of the, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, down, downsides about that though, is like uh, our lives are kind of like so scripted. Like I know my schedule up until uh, the last game of the season, every mm-hmm. hour of the day. Um, 
but like in the off season, uh, since you don't have anyone planning your days like that, you kind of like get all like uh, jumbled so up in that. And you don't really know what to do with your time sometimes. Uh, sometimes, but then you get into the groove, uh, especially when you like start uh, working out and do your off season training. You kind of manage your days that way. How long is the off season? I don't know if that's a stupid question, but I'm asking it. No, it's about uh, three and a half to four months. That's a long time, man. That's a big portion of the year. Yeah, that's a lot of time on your own. So you got to really be able to, I guess, like, you know, manage that's, that time really wisely. Dude, that's a lot of time looking at yourself in the mirror going, who am I? Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously, seriously. I could, like, um, so, so I kind of told you that the theme of this podcast, I'm going to read it from my piece of paper that I've scribbled all over. It's called purpose what leads us to a more integrated relationship to our external world and like because I like to make everything about myself um, the reason why I came up with this theme of purpose and meaning and identity is because like I've just been through a long lockdown here in Asia we've been quite badly affected by um, the Delta variant of the virus and like I'm such a, I, I love my job. I love my purpose, that the, the purpose that it gives me in life and the identity that it gives me, that when it was taken away from me for a few months and there was just so much uncertainty, I was really looking at myself in the mirror going like, who am I without this, this framework of my job and what I love doing? Like, you know. You think those kind of like that, you know, there are some dark moments in there, but you know, what really, what I kind of figured out is that you are your value system. You, you find meaning in life, not through just whatever job you happen to be doing, but it's like how you apply your values and your passion to different aspects of life. And I see that in both your your work, uh, your photography work, and in your your, I think, from what I've seen in your sports, um, tell me about. Do you? This is a, a theory of mine. Just watching American football, but do you think there's a lot of creativity that needs to happen within the sport as well to be yeah. exceptional? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, most of our positions like. Uh, the beautiful thing about football, I think, is like you have 11 guys on the field at each time on each side and each person has to do their job uh, almost perfectly um, for like one player to work or like, uh, you know, and like I can I cannot do my job right. And the ball gets outside of me and then the running back scores a touchdown and everyone else could have done their job uh, perfectly. But like if I did my job, I affected so many different uh, so many other guys uh, on the team. Um so yeah, I think um, football does a really great job of just, of, of just like teaching you, um, you know, I don't know, kind of just like do your job and like you know, um, <laughs> almost, I kind of yeah. get lost. That's what the question you was did like uh, diving down into that, but no, you 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 answered that really well. Let me ask you this: Is there space for like the unexpected, and can the unexpected in your game? like actually be really really good tool to use because some part of creativity for me is like okay this is how i see this is my logical brain looking at what creativity is to me to be creative to be an artist or a scientist or whatever because they're all creative things or a sports person you need framework so you need a clear framework and it's within that framework that you can make infinite combinations of whatever you're yep. working with. And that's creativity. Yep. Is there, do you think that unexpected unknown is like a powerful tool in the sport too? Yeah, I think so. Especially with uh, pass rushing, which is my main job. Um, I think there's like such a beautiful Explain. art to pass rushing. Um, uh, pass rushing, for like those who don't know, it's just basically... Uh, the way an edge rusher or, or defensive lineman uh, gets to the quarterback, um, usually there's like one or two or three people blocking you. And it's like you're 
own individual, I guess, creativity uh, you're using to get around this person, whether it's like via like hand moves or just like speed or just like your sheer like power. But I mean, these are things you practice each and every single day. Um, just like these different moves. Um, and it's almost like ballet, if you watch mm -hmm. it, like sometimes. Um, just Beautiful. with the different moving <laughs> movements, uh, movements uh, guys are doing on the field, and it's like it's beautiful to watch uh, when it's mm. done. Uh, really well. It really is beautiful to watch, really. Um, that's a beautiful segue into creativity in a more literal sense, which is your photography. Um, I'm guessing you kind of started playing around with cameras at college, at university, and then. Um, what, what, like, why a camera and what got you more and more into taking photos? How did that develop? Yeah, um, one that was just like, I don't know, just kind of, I just wanted to kind of like take snapshots of these like kind of moments uh, that were happening around me, whether it's just like spending time with friends or family uh, in college. I think that's kind of how it started. Mm. And, you know, I think it kind of develops uh, into different like, places from there um, when you really like kind of like study photography, uh, the art of it. And uh, just like from looking at uh, images of like different photographers I love, uh, how they use their camera to kind of tell stories. And it's kind of like an escape, uh, honestly. Um, you can kind of get lost and just like kind of taking photos and um, you know, creating images. Um, mm -hmm. I think images are really important. Yeah, let's talk about your first um maybe more serious body of work that's more kind of intentional and creative, which is the series you did um, on the firefighters the, um, in New York. Is that correct? Yeah. Tell yeah. us about um, that. Yeah, so I met these uh, group of firefighters um, kind of through football. Um, that was kind of like our, um, our connection. Um, a couple of the firefighters came to talk to um, my team uh, when I was with the Giants in New York uh, about resiliency. And, and while we were kind of conversating, uh, they invited me to come out to the firehouse uh, and check it out. Um, they had this kind of like historic building um, in, the, in bed Stuy, Brooklyn. And, you know, it was kind of like this, like kind of like a crazy moment where like these like brother, this brotherhood was kind of inviting me to their space and, um, you know, and kind of invited me there and like just being surrounded by them. Um, it was kind of amazing just got kind of like watching them kind of interact with each other. And I got the same like kind of sense of uh, brotherhood that I kind of feel in the locker room. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, they let me document them in their space. And I, I was really kind of grateful for that. Uh, and I was able to kind of show that um, at a gallery in New York. And, um, you know, it was really cool being able to see my work uh, that way. And kind of that was like the first, so cool. uh, kind of like my first project in that in photography, which is really cool. Yeah, you really get a sense from those pictures that, yeah, you, the people in, in, the, in the photos are not really like too conscious of your presence. And the, sometimes when you pull out a camera in a situation, people freeze up or they change. And that's like, that's the beauty of these photos is that they, they really capture such real moments and such human moments. Um, how do you, how do you go about doing that? I guess that's about the relationship that you build with these guys. Yeah, I think it's all about trust. Um, I mean, they were, they invited me to their own space and I was trying to be a really good job of just being kind of respectful of that, mm. uh, and kind of just be like a fly on the wall and just kind of let them do their thing. And, uh, they kind of, they trusted me to make those images and, you know, having some of the tools I was able to use. Um, you know, to document like the, like the, like the M6, um, I don't know. It, it just kind of let me be a fly on the wall, um, mm. while like making those shoots. Yeah. Let's talk about your toolkit. So do you have like, I see you're shooting on 35 mil on medium format sometimes. Um, like what are your favorite tools that you like to use? Yeah, I like uh, 35 millimeter. I also love being format, uh, being able to have that bigger frame. Um, you can capture a lot more detail, sometimes color and light. Um, and just switching it up, honestly, um, with different lenses. Um, but most of the time, I like uh, wide lenses, usually around like a 28. Because uh, mm -hmm. like you get to capture a lot of like a, a lot of what's yeah. happening. Yeah. Exactly. 
um, one of my favorite series of photos that you shot were the portraits of your mother and your grandmother um, on a like a, on a backdrop. So you would have done that what in a studio? No, I actually did that in front of my house <laughs> or my family's house in Charlotte. Um, there's this like uh, there these trees like right in front of the house that were like really really short uh, when I was younger, um, and like over the years as I, I, I'd come back and visit uh, visit my mom at home, uh, they kind of like they got really really big, and I thought it was like the perfect backdrop to kind of take uh, the images like my mom. Uh, my grandma and I took that a couple years ago and it's like also one of my favorite images as well. Yeah, I read, you know, you wrote a caption under the image of your grandma that you hadn't seen her for like 13 years before that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so it was really, yeah, just being able to capture that moment as far, obviously with my mom and my grandma, I kind of shared that with them, um, especially after not seeing her for that long, uh, being in the States. Um, mm. It was really special for me. Yeah, let's talk about these mother figures and father figures in your, you know, your growing up and your the the who are the foundation of who you are. Like, what what were the roles of your mother and father? Like, you know, was it, was there a good good cop bad cop? Like, what were the fundamental <laughs> values that they really like that you really got from them that kind of guide you in and just finding a way. Um, yeah, I mean, the biggest thing with my family was just kind of like respect for your elders and academics was were the most important thing uh, and family. Um, and I think those uh, three things are something I, I kind of carry uh, along with some of my values. Um, I was going to say and, your, mom, your mom's a great cook. <laughs> yeah, she's an amazing cook. Uh, she loves cooking for anyone and everyone, especially especially me and my siblings. Um, she's fed a bunch of my teammates uh, before, and she just loves uh, loves doing that. Uh, she makes a lot of traditional Nigerian dishes, so it's really interesting when I get to kind of introduce guys uh, to, you know, my, my culture. That's so cool. That's what it's all yeah. about, really. It's like, that's what all, of, to me, that's what all of this is all about. It's just like sharing your little slice of your world with the rest of the world or just that's what art is for me what that's what being creative is for me is just like showing your perspective of the world with other yeah. people because like sometimes we forget like we all have different values and sometimes we forget about something that might be quite important in life that somebody else really appreciates and that's that's the real beauty of it all um that brings me to your current exhibition in LA of portraits of sh things you shot last year of your teammates. Yeah. Talk, let's, can you tell us about, I haven't seen the exhibition because I don't live in LA, but yeah. tell us about <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so a lot of those images I took uh, last year during COVID, um, and I don't know if it's, I just, I, I took that as like a year just to kind of bring the, my camera into my locker room, uh, which I usually don't do because um, it's such a sacred space for us. Um, and I was just kind of able to catch up some moments uh, in that kind of like defining year on uh, COVID. Uh, like we had to wear masks, like in a locker room uh, with like all these like guys that we go play out on the field with. And like, you know, it was, it was, it was just kind of like a special time um, just kind of going through um, all that was going on that year uh, uh, with my teammates, um, and I was able to capture some really special images uh, images <laughs> uh, that I hold uh, dear to my heart. Uh, my brother, my teammates, um, some family, and you know, kind of my way of like turning the camera back around um, on my point of view. Yeah, beautiful. How long is that going to be showing for in LA? Uh, I think that's going to be showing up for about a month and a half uh, in L.A. and Boston at the Leica stores. Oh, sweet. Beautiful. Well, yeah. If anyone listening is in either of those two cities, really recommend <laughs> checking out those images. Um, now let's talk about what you've got coming up. You know, you're out of, you know, you're off the field recovering 
what does the future hold for you at the present moment? Yeah, um, basically right now, um, I'm just working to get back uh, to playing shape and just coming back next year as strong as possible. Um, that's really all that's going to be on my mind, um, especially going into this um, this next off season, um, coming off of, of an injury like this and surgery, mm. going through surgery for the first time. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah, so it's, it's generally just going to be going through those uh, different challenges and, yeah, just kind of excited for it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, like keeping that mental strength. I love the word resilience that you brought up um, just before when you talked about the fire, the, um, the what do you call them, the first responders? Um, yeah. You know, how they came to your team to talk about resilience. Resilience is like such a powerful word because to me, um, you can't have, res you can't be a resilient human unless you acknowledge your shadow side, your downfalls, um, your, you know, it's a big yin yang symbol. You know, you can't be a strong person without um, being fully aware of, of your entirety. And, you know, that's the beauty of it too. Um, it's the struggle yeah. and the beauty. And, you know, you gotta be a pretty tough person to to, you know, like go through such an in injury like that and have the mental strength to propel yourself forward. But you seem like you're in a great mindset right now. And I'm sure you have your art as an outlet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I always, always have like a, a great support team around me uh, mm. through my family, uh, my teammates and friends um, and my dog, different doctors. Um, that I work with. So I th I know I'm in good hands and just yeah. about going through this process and kind of leaning on them. Yeah, beautiful. And your French bulldog. Exactly. I got a French bulldog and a pit bull named and Ruby. And a pit bull <laughs> named Ruby. That's what a support team. Well, beautiful. Yeah, it's the best support team. Yeah. Well, um, I wish you all the best energy in the universe for your recovery. Thank you have you. a bright, bright future ahead of you for sure. And yeah, if anyone wants to check out your work, your photography work, how can they do that? Uh, I post a lot on Instagram at Romeo Aquara, R-O-M-E-O-K-W-A-R-A. -E and check out my work at the Lucky Store in LA, in Boston. Yeah. And yep, that's Sweet. it. Sweet. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for spending the thank time. You sharing Kokpun Ka. I heard you went to Thailand. You told me you went to Thailand before. So Yes, Kok once. It's a great well, trip. Love Thailand. Yeah. Thailand will welcome you anytime. And yeah, thanks for thanks for the time and bye everybody. <laughs> bye. Thank you.